this, this is a pattern kind of I saw. So we were on one hand, well, you can see this kind of health impact assessment, right? Asking, you know, is a, oh, a great new sort of idea. Well, you know, let's cheer it. But why aren't decision makers asking the question, what does this policy do to health before anyone raises the, the question? Why, is, why does NEPA exist, National Environmental Policy Act, and nobody asked the question, what are the health impacts of this decision? And moreover, I mean, I think what we saw was a lot of the problems were coming from the failure of, of accountability, of laws that were on policies that were already on the books. Who's holding, each, who's holding government accountable? You have to, it's a, you know, democracy is hard, hard work, and, um, um, a, a couple of, you know, I mean, I, I, we found in, um, uh, San, you know, in a, a positive, you know, both positive kind of stories. Um, we had worked on the living, you know, we had worked on wages and that built relationships with uh, social movement groups. And they said, you know, guys, you know, it's great we've got these wages, but we have wage theft. Nobody's paying, you know, the restaurants aren't paying these wages. And I was the environmental health director and the thing I was actually really in charge of, my real job, was restaurant inspections, right? And other kinds of business inspections. So that was, that's where my, supposedly what was paying my, paying my salary. Um, and they said, well, look, you know, we've got a very supportive local labor agency. They'll do the investigations, but once they find the restaurant is, uh, is, is not paying us, uh, paying our workers, they can't act. They don't have any enforcement tools. It's, they say it's going to take three or four years before it go, winds its way through the legal process. And we said, well, we'll just take their permit. So we had the labor, the labor administrator come. We, we said, let's let, get you come and complain. Have the labor administrator show that, yes, it's a violator, and we'll take their permit away. And so we had them come to the hearing, and, and we, we gave them an order you're a wage violator. You haven't paid the back wages. If you want, if you want to keep your permit, pay the wages, and they did immediately when we when we when we threatened their permit, their 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 core business. So that was a you know that's just kind of like working together. Um, really simple things that we had the authority to do. It was in the law. I didn't have to make anything up. The law says that if you want a permit, you have to follow all laws. Right, and the normal practice of my inspectors were that they already, if somebody wasn't following the building code, the lights weren't there, the plumbing wasn't there, they shut them down. If somebody wasn't following the planning code, they shut them down. If somebody wasn't following the fire code, they shut them down. If somebody wasn't following the labor code, huh? We haven't worked with them. We don't work with those guys, right? But so it was a simple, you know, it was a pretty simple connection. Um, something, you know, I think I. You have to embarrass people sometimes to get them to move. And Jim and I were talking, nobody likes people. I mean, people who embarrass people, they, they, they can get themselves in hot water too. But San Francisco, um, so for many years I worked on, a, on an initiative um, with Paula Jones, uh, who was our director of food systems, on bringing fresh fruits and vegetables to San Francisco's um, elementary schools. And um, then we had brought salad bars and it was all going well. We were going to move them to high schools and I went and did a tour of the high schools. And in the high schools, I saw something that kind of surprised me. You had two lunch lines. One lunch line was for the National School Lunch Program lunch line for the people with their, their meal tickets. Another line was for the cash paying line. Same cafeteria, two lines, two different sets of foods. The food for the National School Lunch Program Truck from Chicago, frozen, three-day scheduled, the thawed, little black plastic containers. Cash line, a la carte line, local, pretty fresh, lots of variety. So discriminatory, you know, segregated lunch lines based on economic status in San Francisco, all San Francisco middle and high schools. A practice that exists in many places in the country. Um, so being, you know, kind of, I don't know, having kind of a discrimination kind of sensitivity that I have, um, I got upset about it. And, um, and 
I looked, we looked, we read the research, we read the laws, we thought it was against the laws, we got, a, we got public advocates to write the school district a letter saying we think you're violating the laws. They totally kind of said, no, no, nobody's, the federal government inspects us every day, nobody said anything. Okay. Then we took it to the New York Times, it got, they got embarrassed, they still didn't do anything. They still didn't do anything. I got in trouble. Then, um, then we did something maybe, I think, you know, constructive. We took, we said, look, we'll fund a change in three schools. I found some money. We integrated the lunch line in three schools, all the same lines. Everybody had the same choices. They were all the local choices. More kids ate. School made more money. All right. Next year, they said, wow, this is great. We'll do it everywhere. So, uh, no, true, true, you know, true kind of story. But it, it's that's, I don't know, that's the work of public health. Um, or it should be the work of public health. Um, like I said, a political constituency can support and demand this work and keep it on. And that's key because you run into, you know, we were, we were doing things like looking at San Francisco's growth plans from a, a health perspective. Uh, we had assembled a... Uh, sort of a, with the blessing of the planning director, a large team. There were 30 stakeholder organizations, all the city agencies, and we were going to uh, make recommendations on how, what new rules they should have in land use planning to protect health. And then the planning director left, and a new planning director came. He didn't know what was going on. He went and complained to the mayor saying, why are they doing this? All right. And so we had to, we kind of offered up, we said, okay, what would you like us to do, Mr. Mayor? We can shut it down, keep it going, or you take over, right, planning director? And they, you know, they, they learned a little bit more about it, saw all these 30 organizations participating, and said, okay, we're going to leave it alone. You know, just keep us informed. Um, so people will, people will object. You know, that's not your job. And even, I think, that's not my job. Not me, but um, I, um, I try to get my restaurant inspectors to do more things. They're in restaurants. Help enforce the wage law. Look to see if labor standards are posted. Um, look to see if there are dangerous conditions in the restaurants. That's not my job. Right? And but that's the, you know, and yet, yet there's a, a small group of them who think this is, you know, that this makes their jobs turn alive again. Um, so, um, so here is all this kind of work and trying to sort of undo and resist kind of social, uh, I I the social kind of injustice that's leading to health. But incredible amount of poverty mitigation sort of continues. And we're all, you know, it's kind of a, and this is, a, it's impossible to criticize poverty mitigation. I mean, it's wrong. I, it's, it's, it's there staring you, staring in front of you, and you need to do it. But um, it, it needs to be, and I think it needs to be really balanced with um, working on the structures at the same time. And um, it's interesting, the same people don't usually do, aren't, aren't often doing both. Um, you know, you've got a health system now, a very, you know, 18% of the economy. Um, you know, what are they doing now? They're paying for housing. They're paying for food. They're paying for transportation. Is that what we want them to do? Is that what we want our health care system to do? Do we want to make that a sort of a part of our, you know, what's covered with insurance? Uh, it's a, it's a, it's not, I'm not, I don't pretend to have an answer. It's a very difficult sort of question because it does reduce suffering. There's no one else that'll pay for it. Um, Value-based, so the Affordable Care Act, value-based payments, all good, all good, but they're also bringing us Prevention, Inc. So a large um, impact investors are seeing capital opportunities in the high level of healthcare expenditures and the interventions to save the payers. So if you can do something that can save somebody a hospitalization, 
they'll pay you, you can take a cut for that. You save some, save an emergency room, you can take a cut for that. That's a business. With, with our rich health system, that's a business opportunity. There, um, there's something, has that people heard of health impact bonds and social impact bonds? A little bit, right? So here's the idea, okay? Nobody is, very few, that this kind of providing housing or home check, let's just use, we'll use home checks. Home checks for asthma is, it works. We know it works, but it's not scaled. So we're going we're gonna to get an investor. The investor is going to pay a business to scale it up, okay? If that saves hospitalizations, the insurance company is going to pay the investor back with a profit. That's the model. So, um, you know, it's like, on one hand, I mean, economically, it's very rational, right? We, the insurance company can um, spend less, and the investor can make a profit, the service, and the good will be, the service will be delivered. But we're mitigating poverty, and we're creating business models for mitigating poverty. And a lot of what healthcare is, is a business model for mitigating poverty. And it's needed, I guess. I mean, it's better than not mitigating poverty. But we're not paying attention to the roots um, often, where the same people aren't. Um, it's, it's also, it also works really only in a limited, if we go down this direction, which we seem to be going down, right? We're also potentially creating some problems. New resources to support human needs are justified only when unmet needs increase health costs and when meeting the need results in a return on investment for the health system. That seems a little dangerous, a little slippery. Is poverty mitigation, you know, this is, this is one problem, and are we going to address unmet needs only when they contribute to disease and cost? Is that where we're kind of, you know, going? If something affects health, we'll take care of it. It doesn't affect your health. And only after, you know, you're in the emergency room a couple of times. Um, but basic needs, as we know, you know, they don't just serve health alone. Health is not the center of the universe. Health is one capacity we need to live the lives we want to live. One of many capacity. We need those other needs just as well. And people with the other needs met and maybe not such good health can still make some, you know, probably live some decent lives, have some good choices. So a couple of, like, sort of suggestions. Um, other, I mean, other than, um, yeah. Um, uh, the lens of health research, I think, uh, could focus on actions and outcomes of policies and practices outside the healthcare system. And, and you're a research audience, right? So this is this doesn't, health research doesn't have to be done by, health, by public health people and, and, and health care people and doctors. It can be done by, really by anybody. Um, and so specifically, if I went and I asked Kaiser, how much are you spending today, extra? How much are you losing because you've got food insecurity in your population? What would their answer be? I don't know. How much of your congestive heart failure readmissions are due to unstable housing? Medicaid plan of New Jersey. You're gonna, what, what's the answer? Repeat that for me. Um, how much of your admissions for congestive heart failure are due to unstable or insufficient housing conditions? I'm sure it's very significant. How, do you know how much? I don't know. So these questions actually, there isn't a single health plan, public or private, that's actually quantified the answers to this, these questions. How much are we losing because of unmet needs? And it's a pretty simple thing to do if we ask, if we have a health care payer or plan, ask systematically to all members a set of fundamental human needs questions. Then we could quantify their impact prospectively on costs and use that information in a variety of ways of deciding, you know, of de developing programs to mitigate as well as using that as evidence in the policy process to uh, determine how much 
of the health care spend should we redeploy to housing and food and other core needs, the other sectors, in order to prevent the growth of Medicare spending. It seems like a very, very simple and smart proposition, and it's one I'm a proponent of and been thinking about. And, but I'm honestly, I'm trying to get to one. This has not been done. Seems very, it seems like the next kind of health impact assessment kind of thing. Um, on the other side, I think there's an interesting, another interesting kind of knowledge generating opportunity. You know there are so many programs that exist today that serve people's human needs. Financial independence, employment development. Are we counting how those programs impact health or the capacity for health as well as we could? These programs, I believe, are benefiting health, but where their, their value to health is not being appropriately, val you know, appropriately valued and therefore not appropriately invested in. And I think that's something that could become more, um, you know, it might be appropriate for uh, the field of sort of social work research. And I think in both of these ideas is the idea of we need measures to capture function, capacity, and fulfillment. We need measures that really are not measures that they're measures of health that are like collectively owned by different discipline sectors and and uh, um, um, these are I, these could be seen as measures on the bridge between sickness and um, the social determinants or the you know the uh, community conditions. These are individual level measures um, uh, that could be you know, used to value the social programs as well as to understand the risks to the uh, 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 to healthcare. Health needs an organized political champion. Something I've said for many years is we need a green piece for people. And health has there are there are organizations like Diabetes Association, American Lung Association, that are focused on a particular disease, right? And the immediate risk factors, maybe, for those, for those diseases. There's, there's, but there's no organization, and there's professional organizations like the American Public Health Association, the AMA. They're generally advocating for the interests of their field the funding for their field, you know, uh, et cetera. There isn't an organization that advocates for the needs of health of all people. And again, and that's a provocative question. You may say, no, 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 this organization exists and that's exactly what it does, but uh, I'll, I'll, say that, I'll say that provocatively. And th th this is very important, I think, for the, the safety net, social safety net sector. Who is its champion? And how powerful is that champion? Right? If health, if, if a group of allied health professionals, public health, physicians, nurses, social workers that came together as an organization, as a political organization, whose, and, and whose ask was the basic needs of health, that could be something. That could, that could make a dent. And finally, I think you know, the question of who really bears the responsibility for health. Have we, have we, to our detriment, put the burden of the responsibility for health? Have we given it to health care? Have we given it to doctors and clinicians and, um, you know, too quickly, too soon? Um, uh, one of the learnings from Manfred Max Neef's work um, is you know how technology satisfy needs in singular ways while dis reducing or destroying our indigenous capacities to satisfy our own needs, right? Formula versus breastfeeding, for example, um, uh, is an example of that. I think there are many, many, many others. And medicine does, again, I, I grew up in a hospital and I, medicine can do a lot. And I don't want to. I don't want to obliterate it, and um, I'm not angry about it, uh, it. But it can't do. It can't do everything, and it can't do. The fun, you know, it can't do the fundamentals. It shouldn't do the fundamentals, right? I mean, can we move healthcare to the periphery of social action for health? 
Does healthcare have to be the center of things? We, we've, medicine might have, you know, we, people say medicine, you know, I have an knowledge that medicine appropriated or expropriated health, the capacity for health from people. People gave it up, right? You have to take it back. People have to take it back. Communities have to take it back. Thank you.